following program is sponsored by Adams Financial Concepts. Welcome to About Money, a different approach to investing you won't hear anywhere else. Your host, Mike Adams, is a registered investment advisor and works with investment portfolios exceeding over $100,000 in net worth and has a proven track record of managing long-term investments, surpassing the markets in the long term. The information shared in the following program is for educational purposes only, and any investment advice given may not be suitable for all investors. And now, here's Mike. And we're going to be doing the answer about money. KLFE, the answer... And today we're talking about money once again on this Saturday. We've got a lot to cover. I have two special guests today. They've got a lot of stories to tell. And we're going to book the program right here. We've got so much to cover. And later in the program, I'm going to be talking about China once again. Because they've got something that nobody really knows how to define. And they're planning to spend trillions of dollars on it. It's very, very big. It's very significant. And I would guess it has some impact on investments. So you want to hear what I have to say about that. But I want to ask, first of all, have you seen the Wells Fargo ad? You know, they want to earn back your trust. You know, they want your advisor to hold your hand. That's the ad. I mean, that's the same Wells Fargo, which fired 5,300 employees They fired tellers and low-level employees who opened bogus credit card accounts, bogus checking accounts. Those actions cost some customers their credit rating. They even initiated some bogus auto loans. You know, actually, they charged insurance premiums to those auto loans. All that happened. That's the Wells Fargo that wants to earn back your trust. You know, and it wasn't until congressional testimony that they actually dealt with the upper management who instituted all that. That's the industry I live in. That is not just in Wells Fargo. It's a number of companies. And now Wells Fargo wants to earn back your trust. They want to believe that they are people that you really can trust. Interesting, though, that the brokers are under investigation by the Department of Justice since March of this year. They've been pushing products in view of fees and commissions rather than in the best interest of the clients. They want to earn their fees and commissions instead of what's best in your interest. But they're not the only firm. Things are happening. You know, there is a report that came out this week in Barron's talking about the robo-advisors, rating the robo-advisors. Robo-advisors now constitute only $300 billion. That's only 1% of the markets. The markets, $30 trillion in total. Robo-advisors are only doing 1% of that. But 25 years ago, things were very different as well. 25 years ago, in fact, in a kind of parallel story. I had a travel agent, and a travel agent told me that they handled things so well that we'd never go online. We needed a travel agent. And if you remember 25 or 30 years ago, it wasn't that long ago that in every mall there were six or eight travel agents. It was almost every street corner in Seattle (laughs) there was a travel agent. How, How long has it been since you've seen a travel agent? I mean, Industries change, and my industry is changing too. You know, back in 1986, when I licensed, I went through the test, I went through the whole thing. The brokerage houses had close to 100% of the market share. And they saw that when the discount brokers came along, when there was a change, there wouldn't be much impact. 1975. 10 years before that, 11 years before I licensed, the industry moved from a fixed price on brokerage accounts. At that time, you had a fixed price. didn't matter whether you bought 100 shares from Shearson or Merrill or Piper or whoever it might be. You had a fixed price you paid per share of stock. 
Then in 1975, they chose to go and do away with fixed prices to go to negotiated prices. And in my industry, my industry, they believed that that really wouldn't change very much. But there was a guy by the name of Charles Schwab who had a different idea. He thought that people were willing to use a lot less hand-holding, a lot less hand-holding, if they could buy stocks at a cheaper price. Now, when I got into the business in 1986, still, discount brokerages were only a very small portion of the market. And there was still this belief that people who really had a lot of wealth needed a financial advisor, except we weren't called financial advisors in those days. We didn't co- become financial advisors until a couple of years after that, after the market crashed in 1987. Then stockbrokers became a bad name to have, and we became financial advisors, doing a lot of the same things, but we were called financial advisors that really upgraded our image, so we weren't stockbrokers. But at that same time, the discount brokers began to rise, and they continued to rise to the point now that they have a third of the market. Those big brokerage houses that had almost 100%, they're down to about a third of the market now. The average family income in 1986 was around 43000 but the big brokerage houses were actually eliminating employees, fin- stockbrokers, financial advisors, as they would become. They were actually pushing them out the door if they only made 43000 Merrill started moving accounts under 30000 to a call center because that was too small and too, too small to worry about. You know, that bred another change in the industry, the registered investment advisor. While the big brokerage houses were registered and their representatives were registered under the Securities and Exchange Act of 1932, the registered investment advisor came under the Investment Company Act of 1940. And I'm sure that you're writing all this down and keeping notes because this is really important stuff, actually. Actually, it's more important than you might think because the Investment Company Act required those advisors who fall under that, and we we really were called advisors, to be fiduciaries, whereas those who work for the big firms needed only to recommend products that were suitable. They were registered representatives. They were not fiduciaries. But the impact of that change that began to happen as the big firms began to push out the lower producing representatives, as they began to push them out, they began to form the registered investment advisor. Those registered investment advisors began to attract not just the low end of the production producers, but began to attract some of the bigger ones as well. Today, Saruli, who gauges all this stuff, is saying that the registered investment advisor channel is growing at 6% a year, whereas the big brokerage houses are losing market share at 1.6%. By 2019, that's next year, the registered investment advisor portion of the market will be bigger than the warehouses. That's a significant change that's gone on. But I think there's a new player coming to town, the robo-advisors. Only 1% of the market today The robo-advisors are moving up very quickly. They're growing at 20% a year. Whereas the big firms are losing market share, the RIA channel is growing at 6%, the robo-advisors are growing at 20 or 30% a year. Their fees are 10% of what traditional brokers charge. And supposedly, the view is And it's similar to what I heard in 1986 when I licensed. The discount brokers, they focused on those people who weren't very sophisticated and were so price conscious, you know, they wouldn't be a very big factor in the market. Today, the robo-advisor in my industry is considered to be the, the channel for the millennials, not for high net worth. But my private banking is a, a service that does a lot of surveys. And they surveyed all sorts of people. They surveyed high net worth people, regular, low net worth, 
and in between worth. How do you say that? High net worth, medium worth, low net worth? They surveyed all those people. And what they found in view of my industry is fairly shocking. They found that 40% of the high net worth people were not only aware of robo-advisors, but were considering using robo-advisors. Something that, that the people in my industry, and I go to a lot of conferences that are focused on investment advisors, financial advisors, people say, clients won't switch, high net worth people won't switch. The survey shows 46% of them not only are aware, but are considering using a robo-advisor. They're more convenient, they sound simpler, there's no product push, lower cost, and more choices than they have now. Those are the reasons that they gave. 42% said they were more convenient and 32% said they sound simpler. And a full quarter said they were lower cost. You know, the bread and butter clients of the brokerage firms and the registered investment advisors are the people that are paying significant cost for their services. I think we're about to see many of the same changes we saw in the travel in industry. We're going to come right back after this commercial break, so don't go away. We've got a lot more to cover, and you want to hear from my two guests. I think we've got a great interview coming, and I want to talk about what's going on in China because it could affect your investment philosophy and strategy. Don't go away. We've got a lot to cover. More about money coming up with Mike Adams on AM 1590, The Answer. For more information, click on adamsfinancialconcepts.com. About Money continues. Remember the website, adamsfinancialconcepts.com. Here's Mike. So I've been talking about what's going on in my industry. The robo-advisor is arriving. Just 1% of the market now, it's growing much faster than my industry as a total. That means it's taking market share. And while it's still fairly small at just 1% of my industry, it won't take that long until it's much larger. You know, some of the reasons when you look at it and when you compare what they give, it's all about the value proposition. What does the financial advisor bring compared to what the robo-advisor brings? Robo-advisors do financial planning. They do every bit as much as a financial advisor can do. They can do selection of mutual funds. And not only can they do a complete selection of mutual funds, they can do it much broader based. They can look over 10,000 mutual funds and select something that fits a client's portfolio and their criteria. Selection of separately managed accounts, robo-advisors have access to that and there's a growing number of separate uh, separately managed accounts that are making themselves available through robo-advisors. Rebalancing, and right now I don't have a lot to say about rebalancing, but next week, next week, I want to talk about some of the rebalancing and simple rules. But for rebalancing, which has become a staple of the financial plans, robo-advisors can do that because they're automatic and they're computer-driven. And that's basically what a financial advisor does is plug the numbers in, the financial plan in, and spits out the rebalancing. Not that I believe that rebalancing is worth it, but that's another whole subject. We'll cover that next week. It's, it's no personal meeting. You have to give up the personal meeting. That's the one thing. And you have to give up the hand-holding. That's the big thing. Remember Wells Fargo? They want your trust back so that they can hold your hand or they want you to hold their hands so, and feel that you've got their trust or you have their trust. They have your trust. Anyway, complicated investment management, complicated family offices, that's not something that robo-advisors will do. But they will be part of family offices indeed. You know, which... Which firms survived 2008? If you look at the big brands, the Merrills, the UBSs, the RBCs, they all struggled. I started my career at Payne Weber, and at one time I worked for Wachovia. Wachovia didn't make it. 
Wachovia now is Wells Fargo. All those guys that I worked with, men and women, they worked for Wells Fargo, no longer Wachovia. There were a number of firms that didn't make it. Small firms? There were a lo- Most of the small firms survived 2008, 2009, and they've gone on to do better. The robo-advisors are coming, and if you look at the top 10, Vanguard has already raised $112 billion. They are the biggest player in the whole thing. Schwab and Fidelity, E-Trade, all have entered the robo-advisor. And even some of the major brokerage firms now have a robo-advisor. They're going to compete directly with their human advisors, which is going to be interesting. I think it's going to be amusing to see. Um, When you compare their performance, when you compare the performance of the top 10 robo-advisors, Behrens did a study, and they looked at the performance of the top 10. And their performance over the last couple of years has been an average of 11.43% to 15.14%. That's the spread between the top and bottom. The standard and poor's was 16.2%. Now, Eugene Fama shared the Nobel Prize in 2013 showing that fewer than 7% of money managers do better, do as well or better than the standard and poor's 500 when you add in their fees. You talk about robo-advisors. They're very, very close to what most money managers do. And I guess from the numbers I see, probably twice what the normal hand-holding financial advisor produces. I think, you know, when, actually, I have to brag a little bit and say that my numbers were 19% during that, that period of time compared to the S&P 500. But anyway, that's, sometimes I have to brag a little bit. Can I do that? If you look at the, the big brokerage houses, They're losing market share. They're going to continue to lose market share. I believe that the registered investment advisors who have been gaining market share, they're also going to begin to lose market share to the robo-advisors. The robo-advisors charging anywhere from a tenth of a percent to a quarter of a percent are convenient, they're simpler, and there are more choices. And now robo-advisors like Betterment are adding the personal touch. If you look at the ads for Fidelity and Schwab, now you can have a regular human financial advisor who's dedicated to you. The more things change, the more they come around and stay the same. The industry is changing. Old methods of investing are passing away. The buy and hold, Richard Foster showed that companies that were part of the Standard & Poor's in 1920 had a 70-year life. Now we're talking about 10 to 15. Buy and hold is a strategy that's going away. Diversification, there was a time when you thought there was safety in diversification, that's kind of disappearing. You know, the Great Recession taught us that safety is not an asset allocation. A lot of things are in change. A lot of things, even in capital preservation, are changing as well. The robo-advisor is here. It's going to make a change. And my industry is going to change. You should be aware of what's going on. You should be dealing with your financial advisor and looking what services you're receiving. And look at the value proposition. What is the real value proposition that your advisor is bringing? What are you getting for what you're paying? Is it really worth it? Are you willing to pay 1% for somebody to hold your hand during bad times? They believe that's going to be the situation. Do you? Do you? Anyway, that wraps up this. I want to introduce my guest. I think it's going to be a longer than normal interview, so I want to take extra time with it. My guests today are Ingrid Emmerich and Leslie Lamb Miller. Welcome to the program. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Thanks for having us. So why don't we, and the name of the company, I forgot that, is Girl Friday Productions. So let's start with your backgrounds. Um, I, uh, this is Ingrid. I started out in publishing, uh, book publishing right after college. Um, I was started as an intern here in Seattle at a small uh, press called Seal Press. We focused on 
writing by women authors. Uh, it was a feminist press back in the uh, started back in the 70s, but I was I came much later to the game there. And I worked there in the 90s, um, working my way up from intern to publicity to marketing to editorial, and then finally um, sort of ended my career there as an associate publisher, so kind of in charge of the business side as well as the acquisitions side of things. Um, when uh, I left that job, I started with my lovely um, co-CEO sitting next to me here, uh, Girl Friday, in 2006. And um, we have grown that business from just the two of us to uh, to a staff of 22 now and a business that's been um, growing and thriving for 12 years here in the Seattle area and sort of serving nationally and internationally uh, authors and publishers. Okay, and Lamb. So it's Lamb because it's Leslie Ann Miller. So people sometimes ask about that. Um, I loved books from the time I was five when I wrote my first book called Hen's Teeth. Um, I went on to become one of those rare English majors. So parents don't despair. If your children get an English, an English degree, they may still be able to use it at some point um, and make money. But I went on to graduate school into a PhD program in English literature and then discovered, much to my dismay, that graduate programs in English literature deal much less with literature and much more with theory and criticism, which is intellectually engaging, but it's not the same as really delving into the books. And I love books. I love everything about them. Um, so I left that program after I had a master's degree. I did not do the climbing the ladder that Ingrid did, and instead left my master's program and went, and Ingrid hired me to seal press. <laughs> Best decision I ever made. Yes. So Except for my husband. <laughs> we worked together at SEAL, as she said, and Ingrid has been my work wife for a very long time. Um, and now we have this fantastic company, and I actually get to work with books and do something I love. We're going to talk about the publishing industry. So we have just a couple of minutes before the commercial break, but let's talk a little bit about Girl Friday Productions, what you do. Sure. Um, so we work with um, individual authors. We work with traditional publishers. We work with um, literary agents and on occasion, and we work with businesses and organizations. And we help them produce, uh, develop and produce and market their um, books. And um, books feel maybe slightly antiquated these days, and maybe we think a wonderful way, but really a book is a really fully, it's the most fully formed of an idea. And so we see it as uh, essential for people to uh, have a beautiful, uh, well-designed and well-edited book and to help them get it out to their audience. And it's really about getting their ideas out. Um, so we work with all those different folks doing um, the design, the editorial, sometimes the writing, uh, marketing, websites, all of that um, to help them reach their audience. Awesome. We're coming to commercial break because we're going to come back to that subject and talk about it in greater detail. But we're coming to commercial break, so don't go away. You want to hear the rest of what they have to say about books, and I love books. And you also want to hear what I have to say about China. It's a big deal, and it's going to affect what we do. Don't go away. We'll come right back after this commercial break. More about money coming up with Mike Adams on AM 1590, The Answer. For more information, click on adamsfinancialconcepts.com. About Money continues. Remember the website, adamsfinancialconcepts.com. Here's Mike. So I'm here talking to Girl Friday Productions. Anyway, to Ingrid and Lamb. As I was doing the research for this program, it just occurred to me, as I was doing the research for this program, I saw a thing on the internet that said, 
Bill Gates's five hour rule. The five hour rule is one that works for Bill Gates, it worked for Barack Obama, it worked for many, many industrial leaders. They find they will set aside an hour a day for at least five days a week to read, to learn, and to improve on what they're doing. That means books. Yay. So that brings us back <laughs> to Ingrid and Lynn. So right. let's talk about publishing in more detail. Tell us what's involved. There's been so many things going on in this industry. I mean, it used to be a, a publisher, and now it's self-publishing. Now it's, it's all over. Tell us about what's going on. It's been a really incredible ride, especially during the time that Ingrid and I started Girl Friday. Um, first, of course, there was the financial crisis, which was overlaps with your industry a bit. And it hit the publishing industry, of course, just as hard. Books are a luxury item, and so publishers had a difficult time. Interestingly for us, what we also found is when people were laid off, they finally said, you know what, I'm going to do what I've always dreamed about doing and write that book I've always wanted to write. So Girl Friday actually saw an uptick during the financial crisis while publishers were having some difficulty. So good for us, bad for <laughs> most of the rest of the world. Of course, we're in Seattle. We can't not talk about the great disruptor, which is Amazon, um, and how books are sold and where you find them and how we consume them. And I think one of the most interesting myths, and when Ingrid and I still worked in traditional publishing, when ebooks were just coming out and all we heard was death of the book death of the book. No one is going to read books in the future. First it's ebooks and then nothing. <laughs> that hasn't happened. And what we saw was a rise of ebooks in certain forms and certain genres and they've leveled off. And certain people read them and they're really good for sort of addictive binging. Um, other formats don't lend themselves very well to electronic versions and people still read paper books. Um, that hasn't gone away. And we're thrilled that that's happening. I think if there's one, two big changes in our industry, one is self-publishing has come a long, long way. And we showed you some books earlier, Mike, and I think you would be hard-pressed to choose between which were the ones that had been self-published and which ones had come from a traditional publisher. Um, it is possible to put out amazing, gorgeous self-published books and to sell them. Um, and also distribution. Most of us and most of your listeners don't buy their books in a bookstore. We still want our bookstores. We love our bookstores. Um, the fact is that most people are going to buy their books on Amazon. And so those two big forces have been disruptors in our industry. So let's come down to Girl Friday Productions again and talk about, because I've been thinking about writing a book along with Sarah. <laughs> so coming to you and talking to you about assisting and putting together a book, as a, a new writer, what, what would be the process that we would go through? So I think you should write a book, just from listening to you today. Um, so we work with a lot of folks who um, are coming to the writing process and the book process in, from different places. Um, some are... Um, have wanted to be writers for many, many years and are part of writing groups and have written various books and maybe have them in their drawer and have come back to them a lot of times and they're finally ready to go with it. Um, others are um, really subject matter experts like yourself who are um, really have a deep um, knowledge base and they want to share their perspective on that with um, their audience and reach a wider audience. So we, the first thing that we do is we, um, we pride ourselves in a very high-touch relationship with all of our clients and our potential clients. And um, we know from our years in book publishing, because most of us came from traditional book publishing that work at Girl Friday, that um, it's a very collaborative, um, high-touch relationship. And it, it always had the best relationships in publishing that storied editor author relationship. That's what we um, continue to pride ourselves on because a lot of beautiful work comes out of that. 
So the first thing that we like to do is to talk to um, talk to our clients about what their goals and dreams are for their book. Um, is this something that they want to produce as um, part of their brand marketing? Is it something, is it a lifelong dream that they want to put out there and change their career from? Do they want to, sh is this something they want to just share with their family and friends? Is it a calling card? Is it, hope maybe their dream is to have it published traditionally. All of those things are possible, but we like to find out first what, what are their goals and there are different paths that they can take to sort of hopefully reach those goals. The nice thing about self-publishing, as Leslie Lamb was saying, is that it is a much more viable, intriguing path than it used to be um, because you have more control you can create a beautiful project, um, a beautiful book, and you can get it out to your readers in a way that you couldn't before. So, um, I, you know, obviously, traditional publishing has amazing, um, uh, still puts out amazing work, but self-publishing just provides a whole other avenue for folks. So what we do is we, after we have that conversation and we decide which way to go, then we talk to you about the process and how much you want to be involved in um, producing that first draft. A lot of people want already have a draft or want to work with an editor to sort of get to that place. Others really um, just don't have the time or inclination to put into writing, which can be a very solitary and difficult um, process. And so in that case, we have ghostwriters that we match um, our clients with, and so they can get that um, that first draft together and feel good about that. And then we, we pair them with a production editor in-house who moves them through the whole process and that, that is their person that they are always in touch with and it's a real person, not a robo <laughs> production editor yet. Um, and they will help them through the whole process in terms of design, in terms of you know cover interior, they want a website, marketing plan, et cetera. So um, we really do soup to nuts. The, uh, w the last thing I was going to say is that the one thing that really has changed, Leslie was talking about all the different changes in terms of um, technology. And really, um, self-publishing has evolved and matured. And what a lot of authors are finding is to be successful, they really need to assemble a great team or go to a company like ours that puts together that great team for them and kind of knows publishing, so. I happened to be at a conference, as I shared earlier, that Jack Confield, or Canfield was at. He wrote Chicken, Chicken Soup for the Soul, mm -hmm. read one of those books. Mm -hmm. And he talked, it was not about writing books, it was about entrepreneurship mm -hmm. and building business. And he talked about being turned down by 144 publishers Finally getting somebody that would publish a book, they said, each of the publishers said, there's no market for short stories, and so they didn't want to touch the book. They found a publisher that would publish it, but they had to pre-sell 20,000 copies. Wow. So they spent 14 months every day going out, interviewing, sending free copies to, or free introductions to celebrities doing everything they could to get to their 20,000 and eventually of course the story the rest of the story is that at one time they had seven books on the the best sellers list but it's a long process mm -hmm. and to write a book seems like a fun thing to do an interesting <laughs> thing to do <laughs> but you know that was I insight and I'm sure you can deliver even more as we talk about the process. It's not just the writing that's involved. It's a lot more than the writing. So give us a little more insight into that. Well, I mean, I love what you just said about entrepreneurship because obviously Ingrid and I are entrepreneurs. We started our own company. And what we try to tell all of our clients is if you're about to become an author, whether you're traditionally published or self-published, you're about to become an entrepreneur. And I think that where we are now, we're recognizing, and it's not dirty anymore to think of this as a business. Of course it's a business to publish mm -hmm. books. But it used to be cloaked in all of this 
romance and mystery and you were up in your velvet tower writing and you know I didn't want to have to market my book <gasps> you're just supposed to want to buy it it's going to fly off the shelves it won't and you need to work really hard to reach your readers to do your market research um, to build your platform this is I mean all of those pieces we have probably in between seven and 13 people working on your project and you're going to have to be one of those people working harder than any of us. So tell us how somebody would reach you, how they would find you if they're interested in writing a book. Well, we have a gorgeous new relaunched website that we're very proud of. Um, it's girlfridayproductions.com. So you can definitely find us there. And uh, that has all our contact information. You can give us a call. You can email us. Uh, you can reach us on Twitter, on Facebook. So many ways. So many ways, and we'd love to hear from you. Yes. So if you are a listener and wanting to think about writing a book, this is the place to start. Contact Girl Friday Productions, and you now know how to do that. We're going to come right back and talk about China. Don't go away. We've got lots to talk about. Money. More about money coming up with Mike Adams on AM 1590, The Answer. For more information, click on adamsfinancialconcepts.com. About Money continues. Remember the website, adamsfinancialconcepts.com. Here's Mike. So I've been talking about China. I've been talking on and off for a couple of years, probably closer to 10 years. But anyway, China, if I can sum it up in one word, they want to eat our lunch. They want to lead the world. Whether you like Trump or not, the U.S. is being viewed by most developing nations as withdrawing from world leadership and China stepping in. When we withdrew from TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, China was visiting all those countries to develop relationships with those countries. When we withdrew from the Climate Accord in Paris, China stepped in and said, we'll lead the, the effort. When we put tariffs on the European allies, who was there to visit the European leaders to say, we should do a trade pact with you and we won't charge you tariffs? China. Made in China was the big initiative that came out of the Communist Party confab that happened earlier this year. It was the big thing to, that set China on. They wanted to, to increase and dominate the high-tech industries through Made in China 2025. That was huge. Now comes a new initiative called the Belt, the Belt and Road Initiative. The Belt and Road, this, they want to rebuild the Silk Road. When you look at the Silk Road, it wasn't just one path across China to, to Turkey. It was covering most of South Asia. That, that concept is being applied with China now with the what's called the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative. China wants to reconstruct the Silk Road, but not just the road. They want to construct what I call the Silk Planet. The Economist magazine called it China, Planet China. I believe that's really true. The road is mostly covering the sea. The belt is the land. And Xi Jinping calls it the project of the century. And they're ready to finance it. They're ready to pump billions of dollars into rebuilding the Belt and Road Initiative through Africa and through the Middle East to Europe. But that's not all. They want the, the initiative to cover the Pacific. They want it to cover the Arctic Ocean. <clears throat> and they're willing to commit trillions of dollars to the initiative. They want to build up Tajikistan and Kazakhstan, countries which you'd have a hard time probably 
identifying on a map. Those are countries that border China. They want to build them up economically because they're concerned about those countries being a, a hotbed for Islamic terrorism. They want to build those up. They want to put in railroads. They want to put in roads. They want to build air, airports. They're willing to put up the money, trillions of dollars. You know, when you look at countries like Azerbaijan and Georgia, those middle nations between Europe and Asia, they're very, very excited about this initiative because it gives them access to Europe and to the developed nations. They, they don't mention when they talk about these initiatives that when China oversees these projects and furnishes the cash for the projects, no one's going to be able to question human rights. No one's going to be able to question corruption. No one's going to be able to question their control of intellectual property or their theft of intellectual property. You know, they're probably going to require Chinese labor to be very heavily involved. And the countries will pile on huge quantities of debt owed to China to build these railroads. We know, for example, already a couple places have already done this. It gives China a strategic hold. And we know for some examples. Pakistan just had an election. And the candidates that were running for president were bragging about which one brought the most Chinese investment into Pakistan. They brought so much Chinese investment and so much debt into Pakistan that in Pakistan's case, they're having to consider an international monetary fund bailout because they're in so much financial trouble. They can't meet the debt load. Ch a Chinese company, financed by the Chinese government, of course, built the port at Hambanatoda in Sri Lanka. It's a Chinese company. The Sri Lanka government guaranteed it. Sri Lanka has not been able to repay the debt. And that port has been repossessed by the Chinese company. And guess whose navy now resides in that port? The Chinese navy now resides in the port. China is ready to spend trillions of dollars to put in ports all around the Pacific. Guess who their target is? It's not Sri Lanka. It's not Myanmar. It's not Thailand. It's the United States. They really want to dominate the Pacific. They want to replace us. It's not a plan, which is like most of the plans that come out of China, most of the things that come out of China, when they say we have a plan, they say we want to build a 1,000 miles of railroad in Kyrgyzstan, for example. This is something that they haven't laid out the specifics at all. This is something that is fairly secret about what they want to do. You know, there's a story, an analogy that I tell sometimes about a man who went to a very small town, could be anywhere, could be Costa Rica, for example, and they spread the word that they wanted to buy monkeys for $100 each, and they had a very large cave, and all the people from that area went out and gathered up the monkeys and were paid $100 a monkey, and they began, after a while, not to have enough monkeys, and so the man came and said he would pay 200 a monkey. And so the people redoubled their efforts, and they went out and found more monkeys. But even then, it reached the point where there were almost no monkeys left, and they began to quit looking. And then the, the man announced he was going to pay 500 a monkey, on her, but he was going away on a trip. And his assistant came along and said to all the people, you know what, all those monkeys in the cage, I'll sell them to you for $350. So the people, and you can sell them to him for 500 The people bought those monkeys for $350, and the assistant went away, and the man never came back. I mean, 
That's what's going to be going on in a similar way in China. That's where they're going. They're going to be loaning billions and trillions of dollars. And when the debt comes due, China will be the master. Macron, the president of France, has said already he sees this as something that will cause many of the young nations to become vassal states of China. It's something that will infect your, affect your investments. When you're doing international investments, it's one more risk. It's one more reason to stay very, very cautious about international investments and this whole idea of going outside the United States to invest. We'll have more on all this as it develops, but for now, that wraps us up. Have a very wonderful rest of the weekend and a week, and I'll be back next week to talk. And one of the things we'll be talking about is rebalancing and some of the problems with rebalancing. Have a wonderful week, and I will be back next Saturday. Listening to About Money with Mike Adams, a registered investment advisor. If you'd like more information about what you heard today or about Mike's investment philosophy and strategy, or if you'd like Mike to evaluate your own portfolio, click on AdamsFinancialConcepts.com. That's AdamsFinancialConcepts.com. The information shared in the preceding program was for educational purposes only, and any investment advice given may not be suitable for all investors. Join us again next Saturday at noon for more About Money with Mike Adams here on AM 1590. The answer. The preceding program was sponsored by Adams Financial Concepts.